What's going on guys, this is Rob, and with the Celestials taking center stage in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and giving us an actual MCU depiction of the Celestials that we know from the comics beyond, you know, the simple flashback from Guardians of the Galaxy, I thought it'd be cool to go back and rework our Celestials Explained video. And the reason for this is because those of you guys who saw that original video, about 12 minutes long or so, a lot of things have changed in Marvel since then. And really the work of Al Ewing's Ultimates totally restructured and gave us a far more in-depth explanation of what the Celestials are capable of. But just for the sake of posterity, I do kind of want to explain a little bit the way things used to be, if for no other reason than the fact that when you're standing in line in a movie theater, you can be like, actually, the way the Celestials used to be was like this. <laughs> but uh, but the idea here, it really comes from a couple different places. The most notable is exactly the same place that we referenced in the old video, being Astonishing X-Men Volume 3, issue number 61. Now, at the time, what you had was basically this explanation that the Celestials were there at the beginning of the universe, and that in effect, when it came to Marvel, the only universe you really had was the main Marvel universe. Now, the biggest issue with this explanation is that we know from the old Thor comics and the initial origin of Galactus that there was a universe before the current universe. But the reason why this was such a big deal is because the explanation given here was that at the beginning of the universe, the Celestials were seemingly the only things in existence. They had created life, but they also sought to create death. Now, while these things are never really given a name, all we're told is that the Celestials created this kind of organic organic object or organic race that was like a sentient embodiment of death. Ultimately, they turned on the Celestials, and because the Celestials could not actually destroy them, they created the multiverse and then locked these things away in a singular universe. Now again, we already knew the multiverse existed, and there wasn't really any attempt by Marvel at the time to take this whole idea and consolidate it with our existing knowledge of the multiverse's existence. Marvel offered this idea that the Celestials created the multiverse, and that was basically it. The other part of this was that again, kind of citing that old information, during the secret origin of Tony Stark storyline during Kieran Gillen's run on Iron Man, one of the things that was told to us was that at some point in the universe's early history, there was a war that broke out between the Aspirants and the Celestials, and the Celestials ultimately won, despite the fact that the Aspirants had created something called the God Killer Armor, right? Just this insanely enormous suit of armor that was capable of destroying Celestials, and they almost won. The funny thing about this was that at the time that was written, and we even talked about this during Ultimates, at the time that was written, that was all we got. We didn't really get any information beyond that initial explanation given to us and just kind of had to just sort of roll with it. One of the things that happened when it came to Al Ewing's run on Ultimates is he consolidated a ton of information belonging to the Celestials, some of which he eliminated, some of which he kept, and then also introduced a host of new stuff. So what I want to do here is I want to kind of give you guys this new updated origin of the Celestials as they exist in Marvel Comics right now, and then we'll go through our normal fare of our character team explanations with their history and all that kind of stuff. So the way this played out in the Ultimate Comics written by Al Ewing is that before anything existed, you had the One Above All. And for whatever reason, which is never explained to us, the One Above All created what was called the First Firmament. You can also call it the First Universe. But in essence, the First Universe was basically sentient in the same way that Eternity is sentient, right? So Eternity is a representation of what would happen if the universe could get up and walk around. That the First Firmament predates all of that, right? There was no Eternity, no none of that stuff. It was just the First Universe. And the result was that the first universe, due to loneliness, as is explained, ended up basically creating what were called the Aspirants. And the Aspirants were these enormously powerful beings that were, by all standards of measurement, the Celestials as you know them now. The big difference here is that the Aspirants basically sought the approval of the first universe whenever they created anything, right? So solar systems and galaxies and stars, and when they created life on worlds and different things like that. If the first firmament was satisfied with what they'd done, it would just continue on. If the first firmament was dissatisfied, the aspirants would destroy it, and then they would start all over again. Now, while the aspirants were doing that, there was actually a smaller group of aspirants that broke off, that basically deviated away from the role that was assigned to them by the first firmament, under the belief that the first firmament itself, and life, and everything else, should learn to understand growth, change, and mortality, meaning they should experience what it means to die and to be reborn as something better than what they were before. The result of this is that they were, in effect, calling on the death of the universe, which was taken to be something that was basically heresy. And so this led to what we call the Celestial Holy War or the Cosmic Holy War. And this was essentially a giant war between the Celestials and the Aspirants. Now, what we're talking about here is a war between beings that have the power to basically do anything they want in a universe, right? To create life, to destroy life, to create galaxies, all that kind of stuff. So as you guys can imagine, this war was pretty extreme. And in fact, it was so intense that this is when the Aspirants developed the God Killer armor. For a time, the 
Aspirants were winning, they were going to come out on top and they were going to defeat the Celestials. But for reasons that are never explained to us, the Aspirants themselves fell into a civil war. What this did is it allowed the Celestials to capitalize on that, detonate these gigantic cosmic bombs they had, which not only destroyed what was left of the Aspirants, but actually shattered the first firmament into an infinite number of pieces. And that's the explanation of the multiverse. Following that, what you had was essentially the second cosmos, if you can consider the first firmament to be the first cosmos. And that basically led to the Celestials as the only survivors of the first universe who literally inhabited just this gigantic empty space. They started spreading into the multiverse itself. And so that's how you end up getting Celestials in like the ultimate universe in Marvel Comics. Then you get the Celestials in the main Marvel universe. And that's how you see them in every universe that exists out there. But following this, what you had was the pattern of universes that would die and be reborn both through natural and unnatural means. Natural means is just the heat death of the universe. It expands out until it reaches the point where it can't expand any further, then it contracts, and then it experiences what we call the big crunch, then it dies, it converts into a singularity, and then explodes back outward again in a big bang. The multiverse experienced the exact same thing. Now, we're not given any information in terms of the different iterations of the multiverses insofar as why they were destroyed. We can largely assume that it just leads to a handful of different things. But for the Celestials themselves, they were both killed and reborn each time these universes were killed and reborn, and each time the multiverse was killed and reborn. The only real exception to this seems to come by way of both the King in Black, as well as the first story arc of Donny Cates' run on Thor. And the reason why I say that is because during the first run on Thor that Donny Cates had, he introduced something called the Black Winter, that if Galactus travels around the universe consuming life-sustaining worlds, that the Black Winter traveled around the multiverse consuming entire universes. And it's kind of a weird thing here because this is kind of left to us as an explanation for why Galactus's universe was destroyed in the first place. In the old comics, uh, Adventures of the X-Men, back in the 1990s, early 2000s, it was actually the result of a being called the Dweller in Darkness, right? Who basically tried to destroy the multiverse so he can merge with it and be reborn as God. It didn't work, but the multiverse ended up collapsing anyway. The important thing here is that what this story seemed to indicate is that where we would look at the various beings of any one particular universe and that they would essentially perish in that universe's destruction, the Celestials seem to outlive that. The Celestials actually seem to survive the destruction of universes and then enter into universes. And the reason why is because this goes into Donny Cates, the King in Black event, which focused on Null. And the way this is explained, and it's really more of a contextual thing as opposed to him actually saying the Celestials always survive the death of a universe. What we ended up learning was that following the destruction of the sixth universe at the hands of, uh, of the Black Winter, that the Celestials existed in this vast empty space. Now it looks as though, and we're not really given this explanation here, it looks as though their existence in this space predated that of like eternity, infinity, all those cosmic entities that you consider to be synonymous with any one particular universe. But the important thing here is that what they did in what we call the seventh universe or the universe that existed in Marvel Comics prior to the events of Secret Wars 2015 is that they began to create life. Now this was a big caveat because at that time, this space was occupied by a being called Null, who of course went on to become the symbiote god, the guy who created the symbiotes, Venom and all those different characters. But because the Celestials were basically creating life, it was like they walked into his home and just started remodeling it, right? I mean, how happy would you be if somebody walked into your house and then just started remodeling your living room? <laughs> it would piss you off. Except instead of Null yelling at them, he created what was called the All Black Necro Sword, killed a Celestial, or at least chopped its head off, which is actually where the space station of nowhere comes from in Marvel Comics, and then used the energy of that dead Celestial to imbue it to his Necro sword to basically amass its power and to make it this insanely capable weapon, uh, which in turn he used to wage war against the other Celestials. Now the Celestials of course ended up defeating Null, basically locked him away. He was trapped by his own symbiotes inside of a world and that was basically that. But then you went into a story that was called Infinity Wars, which was an absolutely terrible story. This one wasn't hugely important and in fact a lot of what we know about the Celestials and the Infinity Stones is really more inferred here than anything else, just because of the fact that a lot of people say that during this story it it was solidified or established that the Infinity Stones came into existence with the multiverse itself, and that what the Celestials did is they took the Infinity Stones and put them in individual universes. There really isn't anything to say that. In fact, the line that people usually use for that is an offhanded remark made by Loki when he asked them, when are you guys going to stop chucking Infinity Stones into our universes, right? That's usually what people use. So you can take that as a truth if you want to. Honestly, I wouldn't really argue and really wouldn't say that the Celestials were responsible for the Infinity Stones entering into any particular universe, I find it more interesting
interesting to believe that the Infinity Stones come into existence with the creation of a universe because they represent the different aspects of a universe. But regardless, another major change regarding the history of the Celestials in Marvel Comics actually came by way of Jason Aaron's run on Avengers. And this introduces something called the Progenitor Celestial or the Fallen, if that's what you want to call them. Now, this was a particularly interesting change that Jason Aaron implemented because prior to this, in Fantastic Four Volume 1, issue number 316, the development of life on other worlds was largely attributed to a race called the Fortescuans that had been created by the Beyonders themselves. And their goal was to quite literally see life throughout the universe. Now, this seemed to kind of fly in the face of conventional wisdom, which while it didn't necessarily solidify it as truth, had largely just been argued that the Celestials were the ones who created everything. But regardless of whether or not you follow that ideology, during Jason Aaron's run on Avengers, what you had were the Celestials, and then you had a group called the Horde. Now, the introduction of the Horde was largely based off the works of Neil Gaiman and Charles Knopf during their Eternals runs. And the idea here is that the Celestials themselves represent life, whereas the Horde represents death. And both groups serve a being called the Fulcrum, who may or may not be the one above all, Marvel never really clarifies. But the idea is that when a world is experimented on by the Celestials themselves, which we'll talk about here in a minute, and that life kind of progresses for a period of time, they call it 19 cosmic cycles. They don't really provide a direct one-to-one -one comparison in terms of what that means here in the real world. Uh, but once that period is over, if the life force of that energy is more in line with the deviance, meaning it's more violent, uh, more, more primitive, so on and so forth, then that life force goes to the horde. If the life force is more in line with the eternals, meaning that it has achieved a kind of higher state of enlightenment, then it goes to the celestials. The reason why this matters is because it basically tied into the nature of the horde themselves insofar as there came a point when one of the celestials whose name is never really given to us, he's simply referred to as the progenitor, is basically attacked by the horde. Now the horde don't usually consume celestials, but because of the fact that they rely on energy in order to exist, where they normally stick to worlds, if things are dire enough, <laughs> they'll consume celestials. And that's what had happened there. And so the progenitor had actually crash landed on earth and then its insides, what you could call blood, had basically permeated the earth itself. And that's what led to the emergence of life on earth. The other part of this is that where it was previously believed that the celestials arriving on earth and modifying the genes of early man was largely due to the fact that this was just the next stop in their grand universal experiment of modifying life across worlds. That Jason Aaron's run actually established that the celestials showed up on earth because they were hunting for the progenitor. They didn't know what happened to him. Once they discovered that he'd basically been consumed by the horde, well, there wasn't really anything they could do, right? They ended up just confining the horde inside earth. And then they in turn basically created the eternals, the deviants, and then what would eventually become superpowered beings. Now, this is something that we've talked about so many times before, but it is the celestials explained. So we have to explain it again. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you don't want to stick through this, you're welcome to, to skip ahead. But the idea behind this is that the Celestials always visit worlds in four hosts. The first host is them showing up and then basically modifying the genetic structure of that planet's race into three distinct groups or three distinct races, if you want to call them that. The first one is basically a race that has their genes modified so they will essentially become almost angelic or godlike beings. They are, by all standards of measurement, immortal, meaning they can never die of like illness or disease, you can physically kill them, but a machine system is basically put in place to ensure they can always be resurrected. That group is referred to as the Eternals. The second group has their genes destabilized to create unchecked mutations, meaning anything can happen. And the Celestials don't really pay much attention to what does happen. It's just kind of like whatever happens, happens, and they call it a day. That group ends up becoming the Deviants. The third group will have their genes modified so that at some future point in time, those genes will start manifesting and basically developing powers. That's the explanation Marvel gives us in terms of one, where mutants come from, and two, why it is that different individuals can be subjected to like radiation treatments, so like Banner being blasted with a gamma bomb or uh, Steve Rogers being injected with a super soldier serum and blasted with Vita rays, and they go on to basically develop powers instead of just turning into like a giant mass of tumors and then ultimately dying or exploding or something along those lines. Now this form and function, this type of experiment, right, the eternal 
controls, the deviance, and then just baseline modifications that will manifest later on. That's every single world. So it's been done to the Kree, it's been done to the Skrulls, it's been done to everybody, or at least every major race that exists out there. In some cases, like the Skrulls, the deviants actually went out. In some cases, like the Kree, it ends up being the eternal variants that, that end up winning out. Regarding Earth, it was really more the Eternals and the humans who basically won out. Now, the way this worked out, because the deviants were really just such a much larger number than the Eternals were, and the Eternals, given the power they had, didn't really care about anything, this led to the deviants actually conquering humanity and then setting up a capital city in Lumeria on the kingdom of Atlantis. And so where this became like a massive trading port, right? Just kind of a huge hub. You had some technological advancements, different things like that. A war broke out between the Eternals and the Deviants, not because of the fact that the Deviants had enslaved humanity, even though the Eternals were tasked with safeguarding humans. Instead, what ended up happening is that the Deviants struck first against the Eternals in order to destroy them. And so when this war broke out, you actually saw the Eternals essentially losing. There were just too many Deviants out there who were just too strong. And so in a last ditch effort, the Eternals contacted the Celestials who basically returned in the second host. And once the Celestials arrived, the Deviants immediately attacked the Celestials. The Celestials, of course, basically eradicated the Deviants or at least pushed them to the point where their numbers that were previously in the millions were dwindled down to a few thousand. They also initiated something called the Great Cataclysm, which was basically the sinking of Atlantis. And so that's why the, the Deviants ended up taking underground. Now, following that, the Celestials actually turned to the Eternals and they realized that humanity was conquered by the Deviants because the Eternals had ignored their role of safeguarding humanity. And so the Eternals were warned, should that ever happen again, the Celestials will destroy them, they'll wipe out everything on Earth and they'll start over. And so that basically led to the Eternals becoming more involved in the affairs of humanity because they just didn't want to be destroyed. Now, something else that had also happened during this time was the imprisonment of Tiamu the Dreaming Celestial. So while you did have a whole bunch of Celestials there, Eris and the Judge, different people like that, what you had here was Tiamu, who was technically the communicator. And while Tiamu had created a few uh, Eternals and Deviants of his own design that would serve their own unique purpose, Makari, for example, being one of them, that when the time came when the Celestials had shown back up on Earth and they had found that the Deviants had conquered the world, the normal practice was that they would cleanse the Earth. Everything would be destroyed. That life energy would be sent to the Fulcrum. And because it was more in line with the Deviants, it would be sent to the Horde. Instead, what happened is Erish and the Judge had judged in such a way to where only the Deviants would be punished. And so this basically led Tiamu to believe that essentially the Celestials were acting outside of their quote unquote programming or prescribed role. And so he turned against Erish and the Judge only to be attacked by the rest of the Celestials who have basically stripped him of his life essence, put his body below the ground and then put his life essence in something called the Vial. And the Dreaming Celestial had basically just stayed there for a millennia, something like a million years until he was ultimately woken up during Neil Gaiman's run on the Eternals. Now beyond that, the Celestials actions in terms of what they do out there in the universe is never really known to us. The only time we ever really see anything regarding what the Celestials do is whenever they interact with people on Earth. And it makes sense, right? Marvel Comics is a series of stories told from the perspective of people on Earth most of the time. Sometimes it's people from space, right? So like the Guardians of the Galaxy, Richard Rider and the Nova Corps, different things like that. But the closest that we got here was actually during uh, X-Men Volume 2, issue number 186. And this actually dealt with a villain named Apocalypse, right? So some of you guys have heard of Ensabon Noor, or at least everybody who's been on my channel for a while has, knows who that guy is. But some of you guys who are not familiar with my channel have maybe never heard of him. Ensabon Noor is largely considered to be the first real external mutant to come into existence. But external mutants are basically mutants who are like Eternals in the sense that they are legitimately immortal. But a big difference here is that unlike Eternals, if you were to cut off the head of an external and then you were to simply just sit their head on their neck, their healing factor would kick in and they would come back to life. With Eternals, it doesn't really work that way. They can just be resurrected by the machine. So it's like their own little caveat going on there. But the idea is that for most of his existence, Apocalypse had tried to make contact with a celestial ship and tried to find some way to interface with its technology. It never really worked. It wasn't until Cable from the future went into the past to try to destroy Apocalypse failed, but Cable's uh, techno-organic virus had infiltrated Apocalypse and then given Apocalypse the ability to infiltrate with machines that he was finding Finally able to do it. When this took place, he was met by Eson the Searcher. And while it is a little bit ambiguous, all that was really told here was that Apocalypse would be given the ability to utilize celestial technology, but that quote unquote, future payments would be required later, right? We didn't really know what that meant. And we still don't know what it means. We know he was taken away by the Celestials at one point, but we don't know what really happened. The result of this is that coming out of that experience, Apocalypse had become basically
basically a demigod. He had used celestial technology to essentially modify his body so he could basically do anything he wanted to, right? He could give himself virtually any superhuman power and do virtually anything shy of reality warping on any real scale. Now, following that, you go into the first century. This is one of the most important things when it comes to the Celestials is that when you look at stories like Earth X, one of the things that was established is that Celestials procreate by basically planting their eggs or their seeds inside worlds. And that when the time comes when that celestial egg is able to basically be born, it emerges from that world and it destroys the world in the process. The role Galactus plays is traveling around the cosmos, consuming life-sustaining worlds in order to keep the celestial population in check. Now for years, that was a Earth X concept. It was locked away in Earth X and that was it. That was the only universe where it happened. It wasn't until Jonathan Hickman's shield and the celestial Madonna that that basically changed. That the celestial Madonna was is not really to be confused with Mantis, like not really that story, but the celestial Madonna was basically a celestial that was pregnant with offspring and that wasn't really supposed to happen. Instead, as it was explained here, celestials normally deposit their life essence in worlds in order to be born. And so that was basically Jonathan Hickman taking the Earth X concept, rolling it into the main Marvel universe and going forward from there. You never really see it happen. And in fact, I can't really think of an occasion where I've seen an instance where a celestial has been born uh, in the center of a life sustaining world and then emerged and destroyed that world in the process. Again, I've never really heard of that. Or at least I've never actually seen it happen. Maybe it has, I don't know. And honestly, it's not really important if it does. But the Celestials really arrival on Earth happened again during the third host. And this took place in Thor issue number 300. And this was basically a story where it had come to the attention of the Celestials that a lot of the godly beings out there, what we call the Sky Fathers, so Zeus and Odin and Vishnu and those guys had gotten themselves involved in the affairs of mortal men so that humanity actually started worshiping them as gods. And so because of the fact that this had the potential to alter the, the really evolutionary structure of humanity or the evolutionary direction of humanity, that the Celestials showed up and essentially warned the Sky Fathers not to interfere. Now this led to the Sky Fathers bringing in something called the Destroyer Armor under the belief that it could destroy the Celestials. It didn't work. And the Celestials almost killed the Sky Fathers. And so with that kind of message being sent, <laughs> the Sky Fathers were like, okay. And that was Marvel's explanation for why it is that humanity had believed in Zeus and Odin and those guys traveled around with humanity and humanity interacted with them. And then suddenly one day they didn't, right? It was just kind of a way to, to sort of explain those things and why it happened. Nonetheless, the final and really more recent arrival of the Celestials on Earth in the form of a host, I mean, they have kind of appeared here and there, but in the form of a host actually came during the 20th century. And again, this was covered during the events of Thor issue number 300. And the idea here was that when the Celestials had arrived, it was basically their final judgment. That the fourth host represents the point at which the Celestials arrive on that particular planet. They judge the evolution of that world and they decide if it should live or if it should die. And so with the entirety of the Celestial host encased inside an indestructible dome, there was no real way for anybody to get to them. The closest you got was actually a coming together of Odin, Thor, and the Eternals who could do nothing to the, to the Celestials. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't hurt them or anything. Ultimately, it actually ended up being Gaia, the sentience of Mother Earth, who presented 12 individuals out there that were basically, or at least believed to be, the fruition of the Celestials' experiments. Basically saying, these individuals are what you've been looking for with regards to this grand experiment that you engaged in. Ultimately, the Celestials were satisfied and ended up basically leaving. Now, following that, the Celestials' emergence or arrival on Earth only ever really came when there was like some kind of a big calamity, right? So the, the rise of the Dreaming Celestial and the Celestials coming back in order to deal with him, different things along those lines. And this again went back into the events of X-Men Extermination, which again, really kind of gave us the initial explanation of the Celestials. It's just one of these things where like, they've just kind of appeared here and there. More often than not, it's really more the power of the Celestials that manifests in some form or fashion. Now, outside of that, one of the big things you saw, there were actually a few huge things you saw with the Celestials that didn't directly interfere with Earth. The most notable of these is obviously the events of of Infinity Gauntlet, right? Thanos getting the Infinity Stones, forming the Infinity Gauntlet. And this was just one of those things where the story didn't specifically focus on the Celestials as much as it did the Celestials alongside pretty much all the other cosmic entities trying to find a way to defeat Thanos. Ultimately, it didn't work. A lot of those stories were like that. A lot of the spacefaring stories with Dan Abnett and those guys, you saw some escapades involving the Celestials there. But again, none of those stories really focus on the Celestials specifically. It's just the Celestials were there during those particular campaigns. Now, one of the more interesting things involving the Celestials actually came during the events of Time Runs Out. 
during the events of uh, Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. And the reason why this mattered is because what you had was the collapse of the multiverse. And while it wasn't just the Celestials, you also had Galactus and a few other people, that what you had here were the Beyonders who were basically uh, cutting a swath <laughs> through the whole multiverse and killing cosmic entities everywhere they found them. And that's why you ended up seeing Reed Richards and Black Panther and the other members of the superhero community calling together the, uh, the cosmic entities. And then suddenly the cosmic entities just left because at that point, the actions of the Beyonders required their help. Now, what you also ended up finding out is that during the early days of the incursions, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four had sent Hank Pym Ant-Man into the multiverse to find out what was causing the collapse, only for Hank Pym to come across the Beyonders, killing the Celestials and all the cosmic entities in one universe, and then realizing they were doing it across the whole multiverse, ultimately coalescing in them, destroying the living tribunal. So again, you know, it's one of these things where the Celestials appearing in these various stories really dealt more with them just kind of appearing for a moment, being part of a series of events. In more recent years, you saw Noel, the symbiote god, re-emerging during the events of King in Black, showing up on Earth, and then actually having conscripted the Celestials into his service. And conscription is probably not even the best description. It was more like he enslaved them, like he took them over and enslaved them into his service. It was kind of nuts. But the reality is that when it comes to the Celestials in Marvel Comics, you don't really see very many instances when stories focus explicitly on them, right? So you don't really see like Celestials Volume 1, the Celestials Volume 2, right? You don't really see anything like that. Instead, it's usually the Celestials having some kind of involvement with humanity and then doing something that requires them to be there or there's just some kind of massive conflict or something along those lines. The thing the Celestials are most known for are the various hosts they engage in, right? When they show up on Earth for modifying the genes of early man, judging them, that kind of a thing. That's really what the Celestials are known best for. But beyond that, it's usually just them kind of appearing in a few stories here and there. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. We're at like 31 minutes before edits. So thank you guys for watching. <laughs> and I will catch you all later. Peace.